Welcome to everybody who decided to join this seminar. It is uh, the second seminar in a series of uh, presentation of uh, SANA PhD students. And today we have uh, Monica Petlash, uh, who is a PhD student at the team, uh, which official nom name is uh, Computer Vision and data science team, but it's uh, Brian and Mo laboratory uh, called here in Sano. And uh, well, I would like also to welcome uh, Alex Krimi, who is the leader of this team. Uh, Alex, please uh, present uh, Monica and uh, her research topics. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. As I said, uh, the group is called Computer Vision or uh, Data Science Team or more friendly Brain and More Lab because we are focused on uh, neuroimaging, either from MRI or histological data. And today we have uh, Monica Pitlash, which is uh, with uh, PhD students in our team, and she's working on uh, image process analysis and machine learning related to glioma brain, uh, which is the deadliest uh, brain tumor. Well, uh, many thanks. And uh, well, as usual, if you have a question uh, which uh, requires immediate uh, answer, please write this question on chat or on questions and answer, and I will try to read this question. Uh, and uh, after the talk of Monica, we'll have, uh, as usual, a discussion. Uh, uh, so there will be another opportunity to to directly ask questions. So many thanks. Uh, uh, and uh, well, uh, Monica, screen is yours. Um, thank you for the introduction and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I. As mentioned, I work in um, Brain and More Lab, and my PhD project uh, is broadly titled Generation and Analysis of Microscopy Images Compared to Other Modalities. But uh, our uh, recently published paper uh, tackles one of uh, big problems we're working on. So today's presentation will be mostly about this manuscript so about deep learning based glioma grading and tumor microenvironment characterization. And this work we did in collaboration with Nensky Institute of Experimental Biology, uh, where my uh, second mentor is Professor Bożena Kaminska-Kaczmarek. So I will start with uh, talking to you about some background on gliomas and what are the diagnosis challenges. Uh, why is it important? Uh, why is it difficult? So therefore, what is the study objective? Uh, I will discuss the characteristics of the data we used for the experiments uh, and uh, deep learning approaches uh, we implemented for automatic classification. Uh, and I will discuss a protocol for two more microenvironment analysis. Uh, then um, we will see some insights uh, and results from this automatic classifications uh, and microenvironment analysis. And I will tell you about some uh, future research based on these initial studies and other projects, projects related to my uh, PhD. So gliomas, origin, they arise from neural stem cells or glial precursors. And the diagnosis is based on pathological cell features on histology. And recently there is a big emphasis also on including molecular markers. And this histological evaluation is done manually uh, relies heavily on manual histological evaluation, which can be time consuming, can be subjective. So we have um, inter and intra observer differences and it may overlook intricate 
two more microenvironment characteristics. And um, survival rates, um, pre predictions of, of survival are low. They remain low both in men and women despite current treatments. And we have uh, several types of treatments that are applied. Uh, this includes surgical uh, resection, uh, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and uh, new interest is in immunotherapies and virusology. And to these uh, types, our work will be related. Uh, some more information about gliomas. Mm, very important uh, part uh, of uh, what they are consisted of are myeloid cells and they are increasingly recognized as crucial in the glioma progression and patient prognosis and uh, the, there is need for precisely um, grading the tumor to apply effective treatment so we are looking forward to obtain advanced diagnostic tools that could accurately characterize these tumors, um, grades, types, and subtypes. Uh, here you can see the samples from... Uh, excuse me. Uh, well, uh, on these two previous uh, slides, you had uh, very well two, two pictures. Maybe you could uh, give some short explanation what is on, on these pictures. Yeah, these are the uh, pictures uh, from MRI. Uh, you can see glioblastoma here. This is for the uh, very introduction, so you can have an idea about which cancer we are talking about and which area. So we're talking about the brains in tumors, and you can see the most um, uh, malignant one here in the coronal view in MRI. And here's also the glioblastoma in, in axial, axial view. And this is the MRI. Uh, because this is um, the initial uh, procedure that patients uh, undergo. And then there is histology. And about the histology is uh, our study. So uh, from MRI to histology, uh, here's the data set prepared in Nensky Institute. These are the cores of tissue of glioma from uh, four different grades, uh, and they are stained with human leukocyte antigen. Mm, these are fragments from tissue microarray, and grade zero uh, is the title for the sake of uh, consistency. Grade zero means normal brain tissue or cancer adjacent uh, tissue. And what is um, important in these images to give you intuition is that uh, we uh, should see a brownish microglia stained. So there is more accommodation of these brownish elements uh, farther on the grades and there are bluish uh, nuclei and you can see them very clearly on normal brain tissue where there is no activated micro microglia in the same time uh, yeah since uh, 2021 there is new vho classification um, criteria of gliomas where they highlight that it is important to include molecular markers, molecular data in this assessment of uh, glioma state. So we have integrated diagnosis uh, where we have combination of histopathological classification, uh, VHO grade and molecular data. And I think it's important to mention uh, three uh, main types of diffuse gliomas in uh, adults. Astrocytoma, we have astrocytoma, oligodendroglioma, and glioblastoma uh, that we uh, were seeing on the MRI images. So objective of our study is to propose 
uh, automatic multi-class classification algorithm based on histology samples. Um, multi-class classification, uh, I mean by this like five classes, so four grades of the tumor and normal brain tissue. We want to test our deep learning model on tissue microarray images uh, because of their advantages that I will uh, comment on the next slides. And we would like to contribute to improving treatment planning by using this information uh, from, from the output of our algorithm that was trained on HLA staining uh, revealing um, accumulation of myeloid cells. Uh, what did uh, researchers uh, do uh, up to this point, um, the use of convolutional neural networks is very common in the field of computer vision where you have um, pattern recognition, detection, classification, or segmentation. And the field of digital pathology uh, is not an exception. CNNs are widely and successfully used uh, for such uh, tasks of computer vision uh, in medical data and digital pathology too. Uh, recently, visual transformers uh, proven to uh, be effective in computer vision tasks, but they may be less effective with limited data sets. And our data set is uh, a small one. And there are many studies um, about glioma classification where they perform binary classification so normal uh, tumor tissue versus cancerous or low grade glioma versus high grade glioma or they do it in a cascade way so firstly binary classification normal versus cancerous and then low grade glioma versus high grade glioma so this classification is uh, limited to regarding the number of classes. Uh, the number of uh, studies, uh, including subtyping, is, is slowly growing, but this is still the field to be explored to propose automatic tools for multi-class subtyping uh, of glioma. Uh, the previous studies uh, extensively uh, use hematoxin and eosin staining. In our uh, case, it will be human leukocyte antigen staining. And there are studies on either whole slide images as input or tissue microarrays. And why we decided to choose tissue microarrays? Uh, because um, this is the situation with tissue microarrays where you have multiple samples so from uh, many patients embedded in one paraffin block so in one array in the same time and with the same technical setting you can stain it in a very standardized way so this reduces cost this is uh, easy to use this works uh, for the sake of standardization also between studies uh, between institutions uh, and this is very high throughput uh, method and human leukocyte antigen will reveal myeloid cells on uh, on our tissues on our course uh, on on microarrays and two more micro environment of glioma is consisted of uh, myeloid cells in 30 to 50 percent uh, and they affect progression of the tumor and these myeloid cells include microglia monocytes macrophages and dendritic cells they significantly infiltrate gliomas with their abundance increasing in malignancy. And now we're going to the implementation of methods. We tested supervised deep learning and in the second part we tested weekly supervised deep learning complemented by single cell analysis. 
this is uh, perfectly known, probably a uh, division, but uh, to add to the introduction, uh, in supervised deep learning, we train our data, we train our model on the labeled data and in unsupervised learning, the annotations uh, are either lacking or they are um, very poor. So unsupervised learning uh, will result in cluster analysis or dimensionality reduction. Uh, the algorithm without the labels will um, derive clusters uh, autonomously with uh, similar characteristics. Uh, challenges that we addressed in our study was that our uh, sample size was small because we had uh, a bit above 200 images of five classes and the data set was imbalanced. So we used uh, tenfold cross validation to uh, for the better use of this data and uh, to obtain mean from our experiments and we mitigated imbalances uh, synthetically uh, augmenting uh, the underrepresented uh, underrepresented classes uh, we choose um, uh, listed architectures uh, excuse uh, me uh, on, uh, on the previous slide on the previous slide uh, there was Stanford uh, 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 as a, as a as, uh, Stanford uh, cross validation as a uh, what uh, what does it mean in practice uh, uh, Stanford cross validation? Uh, that means to uh, reduce bias in our experiments. Uh, we. Uh, run our experiments 10 times uh, using different uh, split of our data into train validation and test set to make sure that we uh, did not have too much luck or too much or we weren't too unlucky uh, using only one unique split of the data so it results in more uh, reliable assessment uh, of the uh, performance. And probably it depends on uh, uh, how this data has been uh, selected, yes? So it, it, uh, the result depends on, uh, let's say, quality of data, or it is uh, some, you are trying to do something what will, let's say, <laughs> give a good result depending, depending on, on the quality of his data. So it sometimes can happen that in the training set you have, uh, let's say, very easy examples and uh, the uh, performance seem to be uh, promising and, and good, but uh, sometimes you can have difficult examples in the training set and is it in the test set? So um, then it seems the model is not generalizing well. So running experiments um, 10 times or uh, five times uh, in, in the manner of cross validation gives you a better idea of uh, how the model works in more objective way. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. As an explanation. Thank you. And the architectures we used uh, were DenseNet 121, EfficientNet, MobileNet, V3 Small, uh, VGG uh, 16, and ResNet 18, and ResNet 50. And we've chosen them uh, based on uh, some criteria and how they differ from each other. So considering we have small data set and five classes, we wanted to test if uh, better will work the model that is very dense with 
dense connect connections between layers or very dense but with uh, residual connections or either um, or maybe um, very simple and deep model like VGG will work better and we compared it to more light models like efficient net and mobile net that were uh, designed for edge devices uh, where they have this compromise they offer this compromise uh, between efficiency and accuracy of the model so they have less parameters and we wanted to test if maybe uh, using the model that is not over parameterized uh, will perform better on our data set. We applied models as uh, pre-trained and trained from scratch. Uh, the models were pre-trained on ImageNet data set and we tested additionally if adding the pre-processing step of uh, HSV uh, color transformation will be beneficial for that. And we had um, ResNet pre-trained without the color transformation as, uh, as the baseline model. And after all these tests, it turned out that DenseNet 221 pre-trained with the pre-processing pre -processing included, uh, overperformed significantly the baseline, achieving 69% on the test set. And here we uh, show to complement uh, these uh, results, uh, the confusion matrices, a normalized confusion matrices. Uh, the left one is from the baseline model and the right one is from the, the best model, DenseNet 121, uh, pre-trained. And we can see that the overall accuracy is, is better and the sensitivity and specificity uh, particularly it is advantages uh, looking at distinguishing between grade two and grade three because um, it is also important to mention that distinguishing between grade two and grade three can be difficult even for experienced pathologists um, because the differences are very subtle mm, so the winning model um, tackles this task of distinguishing between grades uh, three and two better. And we discussed supervised deep learning approach and now we go to weekly supervised deep learning with single cell analysis that together uh, make a protocol for tumor microenvironment analysis. Mm, so weekly supervised deep learning blindly extracts histopathological tumor features from raw or poorly annotated pictures. Then it's trained with patient level labels and it automatic, automatically correlates this architectural tumor features with clinical diagnosis and there is no need for extensive manual pixel level annotations. Uh, how does the single cell analysis complement this weekly supervised deep learning? Basically, single cell analysis is not learning based, it's quantifying and it's uh, sequential. So uh, weekly supervised deep learning adding to this quantifications uh, from single cell analysis can uh, unsupervisedly predict uh, or weakly supervisedly predict uh, patient uh, level classifications. Uh, how this protocol work exactly? 
As input data, we have cancer tissue images with associated grades information. The algorithm starts with patch contrastive learning model uh, where samples of the uh, image, uh, samples of images are compared to each other and similar ones are put into one vector of similar patches. So uh, similars are like awarded and dissimilarities are punished uh, by this algorithm. And we obtained, we obtained then enriched graph of patches. And these patches go then to an ensemble of neural networks where the algorithm learns, uh, learns this uh, cellular patterns on three levels of complexity. So first it learns, it learns uh, phenotypes, then it learns to recognize uh, and retrieve uh, neighborhoods of phenotypes and the higher level is areas of neighborhoods. And at the end, we obtain tumor grading based on the abundance of microenvironmental elements. And what did we find in this study? Uh, that model actually did manage to find these unique uh, phenotypes, uh, neighborhoods and areas of neighborhoods. And the most important neighborhood is, seems to be neighborhood of phenotypes called N2 that was the most abundant across whole data set. But it was not only abundant, but it showed significant differences in accumulation uh, across uh, grades. Uh, also, um, N4 cells neighborhood occur significantly more abundantly in grade uh, two than one. So we can say that neighborhood N2 is pivotal in distinguishing gliomas uh, because of showing these significant differences in amount across grades. Uh, and here you can see um, these uh, dependencies uh, and uh, significance of differences uh, between cellular neighborhoods occurring in tumor grades. Uh, it's intuitive that the most spectacular differences between normal brain tissue and grade four, but we observe uh, significant differences uh, comparing other pairs of <clears throat> grades. Uh, so that suggests um, these cellular patterns found uh, can uh, help us in distinguishing grades. Um, well, and... uh, excuse me, could, could you please uh, come back to, to the previous? Uh, I, well, I would like to learn how, to, uh, how I should, uh, let's say, read these graphs. So, for example, from from grade zero to grade one, uh, there is a line which is uh, it, it is just uh, 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 something like uh, undirectional graph, or it is uh, oh, what is the difference between line which goes from grade uh, uh, zero to grade three with uh, uh, information on on this line? If you could give more explanation about this, and uh, also on the second part of uh, of this figure, uh, uh, what uh, we should uh, uh, look at, uh, so uh, size of uh, of connections or, or, or something another. So uh, please give more information about what is on 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 this graph. Thank you for asking this. Maybe. Yeah, I moved uh, too fast uh, on that. Uh, so these lines um, are connecting uh, uh, grades with each other. And 
on the lines, you can see the names of cellular neighborhoods and the stars are indicating the significance of <clears throat> differences. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Uh, so between zero and grade one, um, there was no um, significantly informative cellular pattern to put here uh, to distinguish between them. Uh, but uh, the, the most, uh, the biggest number of uh, patterns and differences we have in between a normal tissue and grade four. So you can see that uh, N2 is highly significantly different. Mm, so it opts for this distinguishing power of N2. But uh, apart from that, uh, we can see that neighborhood N8, N6, N3 also is observed in significantly more often in grade four than grade zero. And looking further, you can see uh, there is significant difference between uh, grade one and four uh, looking at and two neighborhood again. And when you compare grade one and grade two, uh, N4 significantly more often uh, is present in grade second. And the right graph is the same uh, representation of the thing you have on the left, but without these names um, of neighborhoods. Um, and in this width of connection, this width of connection suggests um, how many uh, patterns uh, was observed and how significant was the difference of their occurrence. Because the occurrence uh, of one pattern and this pattern not occurring in in other grade doesn't already mean that this pattern uh, is um, has distinguishing power because can, it can be uh, insignificant. Mm, yeah, so the conclusion is, uh, as in previous studies, the, the obviously the easiest uh, two grades to compare is the most malignant and the normal one but uh, that means that microglia observed in this grade four is significantly higher than in normal brain tissue but this is uh, significantly higher also than in grade one uh, i i hope that this is more clear now yes thank you <laughs> thank you uh, yeah, and now we have to mm, hypothesize, uh, we have to discuss some clinical relevance uh, about what we actually saw in these clusters of patches derived by the model. Mm, so the N2 neighborhood view and its significances uh, in differences between grades suggests that this N2 neighborhood represents protumor macrophage accumulation, which corresponds to, to our staining of human leukocyte antigen. And we can say <clears throat> that N2 correlates with higher glioma grades and it may indicate potential immunotherapy targets. Uh, and this way, um, we added an automatic computational tool for overcoming the limitations of uh, manual evaluation of histology. And we added this more objective and reliable glioma classification method. Like apart from uh, convolutional neural networks, uh, we add this quantification of myeloid cells uh, to see if that helps in grading. And uh, we hope that this gives us 
insights into the role of myeloid cells in glioma. Uh, the future directions regarding this cooperation uh, include in, uh, using uh, glioma whole specimen images. So now we will be switching from tissue microarrays to whole slide images and to different staining. Uh, and we will see other approaches and probably also including patient uh, age, uh, gender, and other uh, tabular uh, information with the potential to improve the model's accuracy in predicting tumor type, or maybe uh, we will uh, add this deep learning part um, in the topic of showing differences in glioma in men and women. And now I will move to other uh, manuscripts, other studies I do um, during my uh, PhD project. Uh, this one uh, is about uh, generative AI for transfer between modalities. And uh, let's start with the idea of style transfer. Uh, we know that successful experiments on generative adversarial networks uh, where authors uh, created a model that at the end uh, was able to obtain very sketchy input and perform style transfer and out of this sketchy input generate realistic uh, photo. Uh, and this idea was uh, applied in previous studies to perform a translation between modalities. And in our case, uh, we wanted to investigate if we will be able to generate high resolution, very high resolution uh, histology of corpus callosum having only low resolution MRI. And to do this, we used a um, data set of corpus callosum, um, very extensive data set uh, with uh, MRI histology, uh, with two stainings um, and a polarized light microscopy. Uh, we registered slices from MRI to corresponding slices from histology. Uh, we downsampled during the preprocessing, we downsampled um, these histologies uh, as little as was possible to have this data manageable, but high resolution preserved. And after re the registration, we run a conditional generative adversarial network. That means the network where you have um, paired data as input. So you have um, MRI with exactly corresponding histology registered exactly uh, to each other. Mm. And on the right side, you can see uh, the results from this study. Uh, and considering this image um, on the left column, you can see images generated by the model directly from MRI slice. Uh, that is in the middle. And in the right column, you have uh, the ground truth, so the real image. And the goal is to obtain the histology the most uh, similar to the original. Uh, we can see that it is that our result is not as detailed, but uh, we managed to uh, preserve uh, the structures of corpus callosum. And this approach, these results are promising uh, for us uh, 
because we would like to extend this study this is these are the demo results that we published uh, and now we are working on um, generative adversarial network for translating multi dimensional data to multi-dimensional data we are experimenting with this uh, we will see if uh, if this is possible if we can compute that uh, we would like to generate something we called glial tractography so from mri we would like to generate this histology glial tractography uh, and for the reference, you can see um, images uh, of modalities we are working on. So uh, on the left side, you have corpus callosum tractography. So this is from uh, diffusion MRI. Uh, in the middle, you, you can see the histology uh, discussed uh, in, in the previous slide. And on the right side, uh, you can see streamlines, uh, streamlines uh, calculated from structure tensor of this histology. Um, and we are hoping that we can uh, obtain higher resolution glial tractography using this structure tensor as uh, ground truth and uh, generating from tractography. And here you can, you can see our uh, works, our papers published so far uh, about uh, glioma grading protocol, about style transfer uh, between microscopy and magnetic resonance. Uh, we recently submitted uh, work to ICCS as uh, Shimon Mazurek as uh, first author about energy efficient uh, model architectures and compression techniques for green fetal brain segmentation because uh, green AI is an emerging topic uh, now because we should consider the compromise uh, between using less resources to um, have accurate models and we know that this green AI uh, proved to work and not to not and did not cause uh, drop in accuracy in I would say uh, trivial data sets comparing to medical data. So we are investigating if we can have uh, effective light models uh, and accurate models on medical data sets and this is this work about and uh, we are currently working on this uh, generating glial histology from tractography and thank you so much for your attention and I will I will ask uh, any questions about the topic. Hey, Monica thank you very much for for your talk and uh, yes uh, as you said we have time for questions and for discussion uh, or, or maybe uh, in uh, in the meantime when we are waiting for for questions uh, uh, alex would you like to add something about uh, especially about i think uh, about the future work um, well, maybe yes. So the this glial uh, analysis with tractography, we are it's still investigating what if it's still possible. So it's still ongoing process. About the energy efficiency, something we are considering uh, to also apply to the previous work to see if there is a um, an extension of the work that. Monica did it is not just about the uh, fetal brain segmentation uh, with uh, Shimon. So mm -hmm. we, we hope to close the loop. Plus, uh, I Monica is also involved in a couple of things that she obviously did not present here because this was more about these two papers. And 
<laughs> one is the collaboration with the uh, company here in in Krakow, and another one is that she's working on uh, her own startup, uh, spinning out of Sano. Yeah. Anyway, there is a comment now from Vieslav. Yes, Vieslav, uh, <clears throat> you can welcome, and you can you can ask question and comments. So go on. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is, uh, why don't you consider a MR spectroscopy imaging in your work? It gives you um, electronic biopsy so without uh, acquiring any samples. Uh, um, thank you. I think that the easiest answer is that we use the data that we are managed to collect. So uh, we were simply provided <laughs> by this um, immunostainings from uh, from Nensky people. But it, if we would be able to have in, in our hands the spectroscopy images, for sure it would be beneficial. And yeah, the, the, there are very nice open data sets, uh, as I mentioned about this corpus callosum. And, but there is um, MRI histology with two stainings and polarized light microscopy. So uh, I haven't done so far this kind of uh, modality. Yeah, I the... would encourage you to look for this kind of data because even if you... Uh, <clears throat> Test your algorithm for histology, you still can do a sort of comparison with um, MR spectroscopy imaging because if you want your work to be to be clinically relevant and um, highly acceptable, I believe it might be useful. Mm, well. Yeah, and I have the second question. Go on. How... Hello, yeah? Yes, go on, please. How can you position your method, your work, uh, with respect to state of the art? Because I haven't heard anything about this kind of comparison or other positioning. Why are you novel? Why are you different? Who are your competitors? Uh, how your direction, your approach differs from probably in many other centers people are working because this topic is so important. Uh, so what I can see researching the papers about regarding the glioma grading, um, there are this subtyping most often with uh, low grade glioma versus high grade glioma and what is less common is this grading between 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, that is why for now we can uh, obtain less spectacular accuracy, but this niche uh, is not well investigated yet. So the new thing we are investigating is this multi-class grading and also adding uh, quantification of myeloid cells as additional um, factor in differentiating glioma. Okay, so thank you and good luck. Mm. Thank you so much. Many thanks, Vyslav. Well, uh, I uh, waiting for uh, other questions. I would like to uh, to continue somehow uh, what uh, Vyslav told. Uh, namely, uh, if we uh, will try to, to to define what is the most uh, important contribution, so it is in uh, in tools or in understanding the process. I would say both. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and because if you develop the tool that um, helps you. Uh, quantify the data and you have additional insights and this in turn 
helps you differentiate, then then they are both. <laughs> Uh, well, okay. So let's maybe let's try to to to, to, to another thing. Name uh, from just from from the, the same area. Uh, to, to which extent when these uh, uh, new tools uh, are universal in the sense, uh, if you can uh, let's say uh, you think that they can be applied for another type of diseases. Uh, um, I think that the tool, uh, the protocol for uh, two more microenvironment analysis can perform well on other data sets, but, but uh, I have a bit concerns about um, generaliza generalizability uh, based on uh, our results because our data set is small, but if you apply it to other tumors, this protocol, mm -hmm. you can also see your um, see your results, your quantifications, and, and your uh, patterns. And so the generalization, for example, in clinical settings, is is further topic that I I don't think we are ready for that, but we are getting there. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, a, a typical follow-up question is, uh, well, uh, there was one of uh, of the slide which was uh, talking about uh, something uh, which uh, uh, was related with uh, some clinical implementation. Do you uh, what what is your opinion about this? How far it is from? let's say, possible implementation in clinical practice? Uh, so the amount of myeloid cells in uh, higher grades of tumor is well documented in, in, other, uh, in other research. So it is not like we just discovered the myeloid cells correlate with progression in the tumor, uh, we added to proving this, uh, but we offered to the tool that could computationally quantify this in, in the patient. So I imagine uh, if there would be a situation where the tool would be used in clinics, you can take patient's sample and for example, quantify these uh, cellular, uh, cellular phenotypes of myeloid cells. And this can give you insight, this can suggest you and uh, make you uh, be more certain about which grade uh, the patient you should assign to and which immunotherapy, for example, you should propose. I think they were, uh, Marian was asking you the opposite, like uh, how easy will this be to uh, bring him to an hospital so that they can use every day? Uh, but uh, uh, what Monica uh, said, it is that I understand that it is not so, so, so near to, to practical implementation. It can be still as a, let's say, research area, yes? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can bring it to, to more grading. I, I think there are also other, for melanoma and other type of cancer, they are kind of straightforward already, so it can be. Well, uh, I... There are a lot of discussions that they... It's complicated, and we already had discussions with some pathologists. They don't believe it uh, because they, they don't are... believe it in in the method, or because it's very hard for a pathologist. So they were not believing that it, a machine can do their job. So <laughs> uh, I think it's not that far from being in practice. Uh, there is a lot of. Uh, 
uh, resistance to change more. Uh, we need to tell a physician, not that we are trying to replace them, but that this can be an advice for them. Otherwise, they feel threatened. Uh, but I, I think that uh, collaboration with Mensky Institute is something which is very valuable. If, uh, also in, in let's say, uh, uh, convincing pathologists that what you propose is uh, reasonable because... Yeah, well, but Nensky is... is also very, how to say, fundamental research. They are not very oriented to translation. They also yes. bio biology. They are like, I'll say, like Casper in biology. <laughs> well, uh, I think that, uh, uh, of course, it is it is a, a problem of further research. Well, okay, so I don't see more questions or comments. So I think that in this way we have uh, we had uh, we have a kind of a good picture of uh, uh, what Monica is uh, doing. So many thanks for for this talk, and uh, well, uh, I would like to invite uh, all of you to. Uh, next uh, uh, summer computational medicine seminar, <laughs> which will be in uh, uh, in a week from now, and uh, in a week from now we will have uh, as a speaker uh, Magdalena Otta, who will talk about uh, about uh, about uh, flying uh, flow of blood, so probably. It will be also interesting for, for many of you. So you are welcome in a week from now. Thank you very much for participation. Thank you.